can take a hint, sister. Should I do? I think I want to use yours. Okay. If that if that doesn't bother you. No. But I kind of want to just stand up, stand back just a little bit because I get too close and I can't see with my glasses. It's weird. That's Hard fine. Good morning, everybody. Morning. What a beautiful morning it is. I have forgotten everything. Such a blessing to hear everybody fellowshipping <laughs> and having fun here. Isn't that why we get together, right? To be encouraged by such things so that we can be an encouragement to the world in return. And so we just, we love that. We praise God for that, for these relationships that we have. But it's so much more than this, right? We worship because he is the God of every moment of our lives. We worship him because he never leaves us or forsakes us. And we give him praise for that. Good morning to everybody at home as well, and thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, Laura's got an announcement this morning for the summer sunshine. S- for summer sunshine. Maybe several announcements. <laughs> okay. 
Several, several of the ladies have announcements. I am out of the way. Good morning, everyone. Summer sunshine is coming up three weeks, two weeks, sorry, two weeks. I'm a week behind already. Two weeks from today. And we just wanted to give everyone some updates on our campers, our counselors, um, just other areas that we need some additional help. We have 121 campers now. Uh, we had some that were on a waiting list, veteran families that we've added um, to our program. And we also have 30 counselors this year. So a lot of, a lot of kids are going to be in our church building. Uh, counselors, if there's any of the counselors in here or if you're watching online, um, today at 3.30 we have a counselor meeting. Um, it should be an hour and a half-ish or so. And uh, we'll just go through lots of different things that are important for all the counselors to know. Uh, we have lots of different areas that we still need help for in the afternoons. Tuesday is messy day. Yes, it is messy day, but you don't have to get messy if you're a volunteer, unless you really want to. That would be me. I always want to. But you don't have to do the messy part. You would just mostly facilitate. Wednesday, we still need help on Wednesday afternoon for theme day. We also need help on Wednesday um, after camp because we have a overnight for the fifth, sixth, and seventh graders, and they do activities on site or off-site, which I believe they're driving. So we're going to need drivers. We're going to need, right, Shay? We're going to need volunteer homes for the campers to be driven to for a scavenger hunt. So if you need more information, you can check with Shay. You can, uh, Zimmerman, wave Shay. There she is. Yes, everybody knows Shay. Um, or Jen Wilson, and she is not here today. So they are the coordinators of that. You can also check with any of us. And I think that was all I needed. Okay, so the volunteer sign up genius is still online with our Summer Sunshine website. So you just go to the West Lafayette website and then you can get to Summer Sunshine through there. Um, so that sign up genius is where you would sign up to volunteer if you want to add on to Tuesday, Wednesday, or any other day that still needs filled. Um, but there's also a donation sign up genius um, in the same area on the website. And I have added things since I talked to you last. Uh, more um, afternoon and teachers have gotten a hold of me, and so I've added things, including artificial Christmas trees. We're going to turn the stage into a rocky rail railway <laughs> mountain scene. So if you have an artificial Christmas tree, doesn't have to be lit or anything, nothing fancy, just we're going to put a whole bunch up here. So that's on the Sign Up Genius, um, as well as other new things that have been added recently. So if you've already checked, already brought in things, or didn't see things you had at home, check again, because there might be things you could bring to us to help out. Um, those donations need to be turned in by July 7th, which is a Wednesday, kind of weird, but it's also the Summer in the Psalms meal night. So if you drop off your items and then you go have a meal with us um, out in the shelter, even if you've never been part of Summer in the Psalms, join us. Um, also, you could drop it off on Tuesday, July 6th, which is our work night. That is when we will transform the new sanctuary into the Rocky Railway mountain scene um, at 6.30. But if you're not into the decorating, you can be downstairs cutting, gluing, I don't know, making posters. There's all kinds of activities that you can do downstairs to help get things ready for carnival and other events. So I think Wendy has one more thing. Okay, so after we get all that done, we have <laughs> one more um, meeting for everybody. We're going to have a final setup after church on Sunday, July 11th. Um, there will be a meal provided. But basically, this is when we start pulling all of the tables into the classrooms, um, pull out our tables for craft, our setup area, get everything set for Monday morning because campers are going to start arriving at 9 o'clock. So we have to get everything ready. Um, and in place so that we're good to go, make sure our technology works, um, um, and just hope and pray, which, which brings me to, we would appreciate all of your prayers for this last two weeks because this is when we pull everything together, get all of our final emails out, do a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, it can get a tiny bit stressful, but hopefully <laughs> we will get it all done and um, have a great time. So thanks.
Thank you, ladies, and everybody who is involved in making these things happen. Um, what a blessing it is. We've got so many good things going on here at the church, from Summer Sunshine all the way up to the youth group and the things that the Lord's doing with the sanctuary, and just I see new faces, and what a blessing it is. There's so many things to be grateful for. Um, so let's purpose that in our hearts as we worship today. Uh, we're going to pray here in a minute, but I do want to read a psalm. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. This is Psalm 92. And to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, or six. On the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made us glad through your works. We will triumph in the works of your hands. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we claim these promises as truth. Because as your son prayed in the garden to sanctify us by truth, which is your word, Lord, we rely on it every day. Let it be our foundation as we encourage those around us, as we look to bring light to the darkness. But God, as we have this time basking in fellowship and in your presence, Lord, we just ask you to encourage and lift us up. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. This is for your glory that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's worship. So what is faith, right? If we knew all the answers to what was going to happen, we wouldn't need faith, right? But we have faith because of those promises. We have faith because of the assurance that comes through the promises that God made through his word. It's a blessed assurance indeed. Savior, I'm happy and blessed. 
watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. John talked about it a lot last week, and I say it very often that, uh, you know, so many times we see so many people struggling to earn God's grace, right? But if there was anything that we could do to earn His grace, well, then Jesus came for no reason. And it's that assurance that we just sang about, and what John talked about last week is accepting those promises, and he talked about Joseph as a father, and he talked about God with us, right? Emmanuel. And that's where that assurance comes from, not by our own doing, not, not by earning God's favor, but by the Holy Spirit that was given as a down payment, God with us, that he sent his son in the likeness of human flesh to be our atonement. What a blessing that is. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see? It's worth looking our way. We are free in ways that we never should be. Sweet release from the grip of his chain. straining from the weight my heart no longer keep from singing all that is within me Christ for you alone be glorified Emmanuel God with us my heart sings a brand new song the dead is paid these chains are gone Emmanuel God with us Lord you know our hearts don't deserve your glory still show love we cannot afford my kin just straining from the way my heart no longer keep from singing all that is within me cries for you
your feet Such a tiny offering Compared to Calvary Nevertheless Sing it out Lay it at your feet That song just gets me every time because I believe that. I believe that he's with us. Whether we believe that or not makes a difference, right? God loved us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's, it's been done. So we just have to receive it. And we can worship that that's available. We praise him. That's, that's amazing because he is holy. He is holy, holy.
seated and kids can go to class. Well, we are right now um, about um, half the year, six months from Christmas six months until Christmas, midpoint, midway. And our text this morning is a familiar Christmas text. So it's Christmas in July. Eh, Almost, close, right? There is, however, something liberating about dealing with a text like ours this morning without all the baggage associated with Christmas. It allows us to see the text in a new light and perhaps look at it with fresh eyes. You know, a newborn king needs to be greeted, needs to be received as a king. He needs a royal welcome. So we have started a journey through the Gospel of Matthew. So this morning, let's take a look at this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, let's stop right there, just as we're getting started, right? Well, this occurs after Jesus was born. Some time has passed. Jesus will not be found lying in a manger as the shepherds found him on the night of his birth as described in the Gospel of Luke. The child will be found, as we'll see, in the house. So settings have changed because time has passed. As many as two years may have passed since his birth by the time we get to the now of verse 1. So Jesus could be a toddler by this time. All right, continuing verse 1. In the days of Herod the king. Okay, let's stop there for just a second. Herod is a family name. Several Herods appear in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. The name Herod came to be used as a, as a title for the ruler of Judea, much like the names Pharaoh and Caesar came to be used in Egypt and in Rome. This will become a, a dynastic name. Herod is also the name of an individual, Herod I, also known as Herod the Great. He rules over Judea from about 37 to 4 B.C., So, as it turns out, Jesus was actually born B.C., before Christ. Rome controls Judea at this time. Herod was given the title king by the Roman Senate, largely at the uh, support and and, uh, uh, urging of his friend and ally, Mark Anthony. Herod the Great is the first and the worst Herod. Now, Herod is erratically suspicious. He's insanely jealous. He's dangerously cruel. He had his beloved wife, three sons, and sundry other family members and in-laws put to death out of jealousy or fear of conspiracy. Emperor Augustus quipped, it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. His other victims numbered literally in the thousands, often on flimsy evidence of rumors, coerced confessions, or outright paranoia. Herod, though styled king of the Jews, was not ethnically speaking Jewish. He was descended from uh, the Edomites. He was descended from Esau, not Jacob, as were the Israelites or the Jews. 
His mother was Arab or Nabataean from the region that is now modern-day Jordan, and she was perhaps of royal descent. Herod's grandfather had, however, converted to Judaism, and Herod divorced his first wife to marry a Jewish princess. His religion, his Jewish religion, as it is with many even today, might have been in name only for public show. He was king of the Jews, so he would present himself as Jewish. So all things taken together, his overall character, his questionable Jewishness, and his political ties to Rome means that he was never well-liked, nor was he widely accepted as the legitimate king. Now, on the plus side, Herod was a patron of the arts, and he pursued a very vigorous architectural campaign throughout Judea in the, in the lands he controlled. Uh, many great edifices were built during his lifetime. His greatest accomplishment was probably uh, a, a complete renovation of the temple and the temple compound that took over 80 years to complete, well beyond his lifetime, and completed just in time for the Romans then to come along and destroy it all in AD 70. All right, back to verse 1. Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Okay, let's stop right there for just a little bit. Magi, or wise men, the King James says, have come from the east, Persia. Uh, this is uh, the modern country of Iran. This also means that they were almost certainly Gentile. Uh, unexpected visitors, unlikely visitors. They are, by profession, astronomers. They knew what astronomers in antiquity knew. They, they were the scientists of the day. They are not, as Christmas carols suggest, kings, but they are priests belonging to a hereditary priesthood of Medes, which was a region within Persia. Half a millennium before the events described by Matthew, uh, King Darius the Great, uh, because he was so impressed by the ability of the Magi to interpret dreams, put the Magi over the state religion of Persia. Then in the period between the Old and New Testaments, the Magi came to occupy a branch of government in what was by then, by then the Parthian Empire. The term magistrate, which is applied to government officials, derives from the term Magi. Their official duties included the choice and election of the king of the Parthian Empire. So these men are important religious governmental officials. They're magistrates. Now, the Parthian Empire, which controlled Persia at the time, and this is the Parthian Empire, was a rival empire to that of Rome. And uh, Persia, or uh, Iran, occupies this, currently occupies this region here. So roughly the same territory included in the, in the uh, Parthian Empire. Now, the Romans just could not conquer the Parthians. And the Parthians did more than hold their own against Rome. In fact, at one point, they had driven the Romans out of Judea, and Judea was actually uh, able to enjoy a time of autonomy, self-rule, in that period between the Old and New Testaments. Uh, Herod, having secured the title king, king of the Jews, from the Senate, eventually regained control of Jerusalem on behalf of Rome. Judea then became a buffer state between these two rival empires. So here you have a, a very cautious, wary, even paranoid ruler, Herod the Great, and he is constantly in the uncomfortable position of wondering how and when might Parthia make another move against Judea? Now, we traditionally, traditionally identify three magi corresponding to the three gifts. Uh, it is plural, so there were at least two. Um, there may have been more than two. There may have been many more who were anticipating the birth of this king. But a small group of men, whatever that size, would not have made such a journey. Travel was done in groups and the larger the better. There was safety in numbers. These are important Persian Parthian officials. Each one will have his own entourage of assistants and servants, 
and there will be a security detail to ensure their safety while they're traveling in foreign lands, particularly land controlled by rival Rome. It's no doubt an impressive caravan which arrives in Jerusalem. This would be the equivalent of a state visit. All right, so Magi arrive from the east in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we, had, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now King Herod, it seems, grants an audience to these unexpected visitors. They are, after all, heavy hitters from Parthia. He needs to know their intentions in Judea. And to Herod's shock, no doubt, he's informed that they're on a pilgrimage to find the one who has been born king of the Jews. Now what a letdown on their part that no one in Jerusalem seems to know anything about this newborn king. This is certainly news to Herod. He is king. Now note their intentions. They're looking for this newborn king of the Jews. They've seen his star, and they've come to worship him. Are you, as Persian magi, in Jerusalem, searching for the one born king of the Jews to worship him, based solely on your study of the heavens, or your study even of his star? No. There's something unique and specific about this information that requires something more than astronomy. Revelation is at work here. Now, where could they have gotten such revelation? Well, in Persia, going back about 550 years, the king promoted Daniel, an exiled Jew, to be chief of the Magi. Now, it was bad enough that a non-Mede was admitted to this hereditary priesthood, but for him to be elevated to chief, to head of the Magi, well, that was just too much. And so plots were hatched against Daniel, which resulted in him being cast into the lion's den. The king, in the aftermath of Daniel's vindication, cleaned house. He purged the Magi. Now, you can read all about that in Daniel chapter 6. This then opened the door to Daniel's unopposed and successful leadership of the Magi. Now, we don't know anything about this star that so captured their imagination and sent these men on their far-flung journey. Uh, there's speculation about that star, but none of it's conclusive. A star is, however, associated with the coming of the promised Messiah King, and it was prophesied by an equally unlikely source, a pagan prophet by the name of Balaam. Now Daniel, as leader of the Magi, apparently entrusted to uh, at least a sect of the Magi, uh, a, uh, a further prophecy or further information about the coming of the Messiah, which, by which could, that could then be recognized by the coming of his star. And Daniel gives us a couple of clues about this. First of all, he does speak prophetically about the Messiah King. And then secondly, Daniel's directed to seal up certain words until the end of time. So what else might Daniel have sealed up for the Magi concerning the future Messiah? Well, whatever it was, it was certainly linked to the coming of his star. So the arrival of the Magi in Jerusalem to acknowledge the arrival of the King of the Jews is a testimony to the faithfulness and legacy of Daniel. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. The arrival of this caravan causes a stir. An always cautious Herod has reason to be concerned. What are these Parthians up to? Well, they're looking for the one who has been born king of the Jews. Now, Herod came to the throne through maneuvering, through posturing. The Senate had dubbed him king of the Jews. He had conquered Jerusalem, but he was certainly not born king of the Jews. That the Magi are not in Jerusalem to visit him is abundantly clear. They are there to find another who is king by birthright. The stated purpose of these Persian Parthian kingmakers is just another reason for King Herod to be concerned. You know, what are they up to? Is this a prelude to an invasion? Are they after his throne? 
Herod needs more information, but he also needs to tread lightly. He doesn't want to cause an international incident. He doesn't want to be the one responsible for inciting a war between Parthia and Rome. But when Herod ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Heads tend to roll, and so uh, their arrival in Jerusalem causes everyone to be concerned. How is Herod going to react? No one wants to get caught in the middle of this and become collateral damage. Verse 4. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now Herod does seem to have an idea about the subject of their search. So gathering his own wise men together, the chief priests and the scribes, he inquires of them where the Messiah is to be born. See, he understands that this king is the Messiah. Well, they seem to know immediately where he's to be born. They don't even need to look it up. It's as if they're able to just quote it directly from memory, from the prophet Micah. His birthplace is Bethlehem, just five or six miles to the south. It's just a stone's throw away in Herod's very own backyard. Verse 7. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Now Herod has the location of the Messiah's birth. He's used scripture to locate the place of his birth. And he believes it. He believes the scripture. Now think about this for a second. Herod believes what scripture says about the fact of and the place of the Messiah's birth. But he will not believe in, he will not put his faith in the person of the Messiah. He's rather going to take this information and use it to cut the prophesied one out of the picture. He alone is king of the Jews. You see, he takes only what he wants from Scripture while ignoring the rest. That is always a precarious position to put yourself in. And as a result, Herod is, and and probably unconsciously doing so, putting himself in opposition to God. Now, Herod knows the where. He wants to know the when. Why does Herod call a secret meeting with the Magi to find out when uh, the child had been born or when they first saw his star? Well, if, if word of the newborn Messiah King got out, messianic fervor would spread like wildfire. And Herod cannot have that. He needs to stay ahead of this, he needs to keep a lid on this, and he needs to shut it all down as quickly and as quietly as possible. And so he enthusiastically, supportively, puts up a good front. Go, search carefully, come back and report to me. And if the Magi are suspicious about Herod's motives at this time, there's no indication. They have no apparent reason to question his sincerity. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now being sent by Herod, something interesting occurs. The very star which had alerted them to the birth of the child now appears to lead them to where the child was. Now, the star had apparently not been leading them throughout their journey, or at least not throughout the entire journey. This is, in fact, the first and only mention of the fact that they followed the star. This could actually be the reason for their great joy. They hadn't seen the star for a while. And so when it reappeared, it caused them to be overjoyed. You know, when they originally saw his star in the east, as directed by Daniel, uh, they prepared to go to Judea. And if you're going to go to Judea in search of the king of the Jews, Jerusalem is the logical place to go. They would not have needed to be led there by a star, at least until now. And and note, be careful here, you've got to note this, it's the star they follow, not Herod's directions. Now where does the star lead them? 
to the place where the child was. Well, where's that? We might presume Bethlehem. Verse 1 says that's where he was born. That's where the prophet said he would be born. That's where Herod sent them. But it doesn't say that the star led them to Bethlehem. They hardly need the star to lead them to Bethlehem at this point, as if they need heavenly GPS. All they have to do is go five miles south. They can't miss it. Just follow the road, and there it is. The star would, however, need to lead them if Bethlehem was not the actual destination to where the child was. Could Joseph, by this time, remember some time has passed, could Joseph have taken Mary and Jesus and perhaps uh, gone to the home of a relative in the area, like Zacchaeus, Elizabeth, and John, who lived in the hill country of Judea? This would certainly place them in the vicinity of Bethlehem, but not the town itself. And it would require more precise guidance, such as the star would be able to provide for them. And it would add a further layer of protection for the newborn king of the Jews against the would-be king of the Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 11. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, the Holy Family is now located in a house, so no. The Magi didn't arrive at the manger shortly after uh, the the shepherds, you know, showed up. Now, imagine the shock of Joseph and Mary as they answer the knock at the door, or as they look out the window and they see this huge dust cloud being kicked up by this this, uh, caravan, the likes of which they've never seen before, and it stops out in front of their house. The Magi, presenting themselves, finding the child, now fulfill their quest. This is why they have waited for centuries. This is why they have traveled for weeks and weeks and months, finding the child. They fall down before him and worship him. Now, with all due respect to the shepherds, the child now receives his first official acknowledgement as the Messiah King. This is, again, a tribute to Daniel's faithfulness so many centuries before. Now, along with their worship, the the Magi present the king with gifts worthy of a king. And there could have been more than three gifts, but these are the three that are highlighted because of their significance. Gold for a king. Frankincense, a a sweet-smelling gum that was used by priests as they made their offerings in the temple. And myrrh, a fragrant gum that was used in medicine, perfume, and in embalming the dead. Now these gifts were the most valuable, transportable, and marketable items of the day. As this young family is about to head to Egypt in order to flee the wrath of King Herod, these very gifts will be just what they need to sustain them during their time abroad. Now, people respond to the Messiah King in three basic ways. It was true then, it's true today. The first is indifference. You know, when King Herod calls together his eggheads, you know, the the chief priests and the scribes, they have quick answers, but they demonstrate little interest. There's no... uh, Curiosity on their part? Oh, this is interesting. Why is the king wanting to know about the birth of the Messiah? What's going on? No, they let it drop. See, the truth of Scripture didn't make it from their heads into their hearts. And it certainly didn't get any farther than that. It didn't make it out into their hands and feet and move them to action in order to find him. No, so much knowledge, so little wisdom. When Jesus asks, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He strikes at the heart of indifference. Man gives little thought to his soul. He therefore devalues it, cheapens it. Who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Where am I going? You know, these kinds of questions are big ticket items. These should be the compelling questions of our lives. This should be what drives us, motivates us, and moves us. And yet, what do we find so often today? Let us eat and drink, 
for tomorrow we die. You know, the Doobie Brothers sang about it, oh, nearly 50 years ago by now. Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus is just all right. He's just all right. I can take him. I can leave him. He's just all right. Cold heartedness. And this is frankly where you can find uh, many missing in, act, uh, missing in action church members today. Cold heartedness, indifference. Another response is hostility. You know, when Herod learned of this newborn king, he was not content with peaceful coexistence. He immediately became defensive. For him, this means that he will unleash his full fury. He will leave no stone unturned in his quest to destroy this rival king. Hostility toward Jesus. Hatred toward Jesus. It's a tough thing to grasp. You know, for, for most of us sitting here, it's, it's in, inconceivable that people would react to Jesus in this way. What's so threatening about Jesus? What is it that leads to cries of crucify him? Hostility, hatred. We want to make sense of it. We, we look for reasons. We want to know why. But Jesus said that, that the hostility being directed to him, at him was just to fulfill the scriptures. They hated me without a cause. You can't understand it because often there's nothing to understand. It's just the way it is. And this in the end leads to rejection and refusal to believe, let alone give him a fair hearing. And if you've not detected a growing, accelerating uh, attitude of hostility toward the things of Christ in our very own culture, you just haven't been paying attention. And you need to wake up and begin preparing for what is coming next. If the world hates you, Jesus said, keep in mind that it hated me first. Hard-heartedness. Hostility. Yes, there are those who cry, crucify him. But there are those who also say, my Lord and my God. There's another response to the king. Worship. Embracing and declaring the worth of King Jesus. That he is worthy of worship, honor, trust, obedience, and total allegiance. And this is ably demonstrated by the Magi. You know, this last Wednesday evening at the summer in the psalm study. And, and let me just add here that uh, if, if you've not yet participated in this study, it's going throughout the entire summer, every Wednesday night, except the week of summer sunshine. Um, don't feel like, well, I haven't been to the first few and I, that I can't get involved. These are all standalone lessons. The group every week is different because of people's schedules and what's going on, so it's a different group of people every week. So you can, you can uh, jump in at any time. Uh, please do so as we're studying uh, the Psalms. Well, last week we were meditating on Psalms of worship and praise. Psalm 95 extols the worship and praise of the Lord, a great God and a great King. I want to read a portion of that Psalm starting at verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you would hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my works. For 40 years, I loathed that generation. That's strong language. That's God speaking. I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. You know, this psalm of praise at verse 7 changes direction. And it becomes a psalm of warning. It's a warning to those who might harden their hearts and err in their hearts as the Israelites had done in the wilderness. Though they saw God's work, they did not know his ways. 
And the gist of the psalm seems to be that if you do not guard your heart by giving it to the Lord, first in faith, with that is always required, first and foremost, first in faith and then in joyful worship, your heart is at risk of becoming indifferent. And that's just one step away from a heart of hard heartedness, of hostility. And these tragically shall not enter his rest. So, come, worship the king. Cultivate that heart and that attitude of worship, not just something you do once on Sunday, but every day as you go about your business at work, at home, wherever you happen to be, an attitude and a heart of worship. And that's exactly what the Lord's Supper summons us to each week as we commune with the Lord, the rock of our salvation. Like the Magi, remain vigilant. Keep standing on the promises. Keep seeking Jesus. Keep following his light. Keep giving him your best. Worship the King. Let's pray. Father, we, we just thank you once again for your son Jesus and what he did for each one of us in giving of himself selfish, selflessly, wholeheartedly. And Father, I just pray that as that transforms our hearts, we would see more of the image of Jesus in each one of us. And Father, as we look into the mirror of, of communion in just these next few moments, help us to see not only what Jesus did for us, but what it's doing in our lives today to make a difference. And let us go from here as changed people to be your salt and light in this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Psalm 84, verse 10. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 9. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. His grace is enough, folks. Receive it today. Now is the day of salvation. For everybody here, for everybody walking, watching at home, if you don't know, then ask somebody. And if you do know, then be somebody who has an answer for the hope that's in you because his grace is sufficient. Amen? All right, let's wrap up in worship today. I want to remind everybody that... Um, not next week, not the week after. I will keep reminding every week that we will be um, opening up for a meeting after church for anybody who would be willing to join the worship team in service or song. And uh, I will continue to remind folks of that. Sorry, I forgot to mention that this morning. So. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remain. Remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. your love and justice God of Jacob you use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, heaven reaches out to us, your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. 
Your grace is enough for me. It's enough for me. Yeah. It's enough for me. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for these opportunities to come together and just be encouraged and to bask in that grace, Lord, because we don't always get to experience it in the world as we want to, Lord. And we ask you to just fill in those, those times, those days, those instances, Lord, where, where it seems like you're, you're so far away. We ask you, Lord, to just fill us with your spirit, to give us faith so that we could be witnesses as we go from here, Lord. Help us, Lord, to uh, be an encouragement to everybody in our lives and our families. And, uh, Lord, this week to just uh, to look towards you in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a blessed week, everybody.